Light within my heart, light within my thoughts, light within my words. May one and all and everything, blessed and loved, ever be. Welcome. I am Sister Who. I imagine we have all had various well-intentioned people cross our paths at various points in life. Perhaps we're even surrounded by them on a daily basis people who have all the best intentions and who are sometimes very helpful and on one hand we appreciate how much they care about us on the other hand it becomes problematic when well one of the warning phrases uh, one of the phrases that if I hear anyone say it warning flags immediately go up inside my mind I'm only doing this for your own good and of course my first question is how would you actually know what is truly good for me it seems to me in most cases it would require greater wisdom than any human being possesses on one hand I appreciate friends who help me cope with difficulties and who are willing to help get me out of a jam and so forth whenever they happen I, I really do believe that life is a collaborative effort we all take turns being the one in need even granting that, however, there is something subtly insidious that happens when someone wants to take over my life and run it for me without having the deep understanding of my actual experience. They can't see inside my head, they can't look through my eyes, they can't hear with my ears, they can't feel with my body. They can't be me enough to make the choices that I need to make for myself. That being said, I know there have been times where I had to be quite honest with persons around me in saying that I don't have sufficient information to know how to make this choice. I need this and this and this and this information and none of that is available. And yet I am still <clears throat> and yet I am still in a situation of having to make a choice because time marches on and something is going to follow one way or the other and I can steer it to the right or I can steer it to the left but I can't stop it in its tracks and stay where I am having been through the experience on uh, actually like three occasions now of losing my sense of home in spite of all my best efforts my honesty and my integrity my hard work my fairness the the experiences the experiences I encountered made it abundantly clear as perhaps most people say the world isn't fair in trying to address that topic a number of years ago in a newsletter in, in my monthly newsletter I suggested, of course life isn't fair, it's not life's job to be fair, it's our job to be fair. It's our job to bring a sense of fairness to the world in which we live. It doesn't, 
there's lots of things that simply do not exist in the world in and of themselves. It's up to us to bring them. One can see manifestations of love in various forms, but love between people is something that people create or it simply isn't there. It's not something that happens automatically like the rain coming when it wants to or winter coming on schedule or anything like that. It's, it's a, I suppose you could say the divine calling that every single person on the planet has to be a loving and good person for the sake of that person him or herself as well as for humanity around that person that there that even if there are people on the other side of the world you may never meet and especially in this day and age with the internet you can post inspirational phrases and such on the internet and they may be seen by literally millions of people around the world some of whom you will never meet but you may have a profound effect upon their lives such that if your life were suddenly removed from the equation, their life would be less than it could be. It calls to mind the old movie, It's a Wonderful Life, starring Jimmy Stewart, in which he had the, the gift or the privilege, if you will, of seeing what the world would be like with his presence subtracted. That if he was not there to save his brother, if he was not there to extend kindness, if he was not there to make a way where there otherwise would not have been a way, all these, the, the lives of his entire town would have been completely different. And in many, in most cases, as depicted in the movie, in ways that were deplorable and reprehensible and sad and tragic, We each do what we can. We live in an oppressive world, a world that needs healing, a world that is not fair, but we have the opportunity to bring fairness to it. We have the opportunity to bring wisdom to a situation that lacks it. The probably the biggest challenge, I suppose, is when you come to such a situation, you see the good you could do, you want so very much to do it, but the local population doesn't see either the need or the goodness of what you would do. And so they oppose your very intervention. I'm reminded of a, an example quite a number of years ago where there was a major famine happening in a particular country and many people wanted to gather non-perishable food items and send them but the problem that stood in the way was a local militaristic militaristic hierarchy that would intercept any and all food deliveries and not allow them to get to the people who needed them from a certain perspective that is so self-sabotaging because you cannot do evil without it coming back on you in some way. They were, in a sense, well, to use the old adage, cutting off your nose to spite your face, being so angry at the way the world has left your country behind and allowed people to suffer that now we're not going to let you help. I sympathize with the feeling, but it, it still becomes counterproductive because you have people who want to help. Maybe it's the first time they've ever gotten to the point of helping, but now they're not being allowed to because of a past infraction or some way that they define themselves as an enemy of the government, but not an enemy of the people. Um, and the thought just that just popped in my head on that point was what I recall from history class um, many, obviously many, many years ago in which there was an invading army and I thought it was one of the Napoleons in France that they basically just kept telling people we don't want to hurt anyone, we just want to depose Napoleon. And 
the people basically understood and stepped aside and, and let the army march through in peace and depose Napoleon and, and deal with political change in a way that didn't have uh, the catastrophes and atrocities that frequently accompany war. When we I'm trying to figure out how to make this clear, there is a goal and an objective that can be accomplished peacefully. It doesn't require forgetting the bad that was done, it does require not putting everything in one lump. That as much as we understand how everything is integrated, we also understand that we can deal with this symptom here while retaining awareness of the larger problem. And we can deal with that symptom here while retaining awareness of the larger problem. So that it is not that we have not given up on addressing the cause but it doesn't have to be an either-or situation where we address only the cause or only the symptom. We can address both at the same time. But it takes all of us working together to do it. The, the thing I find most fascinating, I guess, about inclusivity is that the things that marginalized people make obvious are often the same are often the things that the larger population has been ignoring that there is a central problem toward which we're trying to get to deal with things at the cause uh, at the source and we don't want to hurt anybody else in the process but we don't always understand all the people around that cause as well as we need to to make the best possible choices and engage in the best possible actions. For someone to say, I'm only doing this for your own good, I first want to know what do you perceive to be my highest good? And do we agree about that? And, and if not, in what areas do we disagree? That's a conversation that I'm perfectly interest, perfectly capable of having and interested in having. There are people that have crossed my path and wanted to take care of me in the past, though, who assumed that I was not able to make those choices without ever giving me the option of making a choice or without even listening to my rationale for the choice I was making. I guess it raises the question from their perspective of whether there were times where they asked me to explain why a choice was so important and I couldn't give them a satisfactory answer. It would be too easy to say that if I cannot come up with a sufficiently persuasive argument, then I will have to accept a an automatic default of losing the argument. and. Yet there are times when I know what's right. I don't know why it's. I don't know why I know it's right, but I know it's right, and I want to pursue it. And the fact that I'm unable to convince someone doesn't make me any less right. And it's not because I'm right. It's not about me. It's about the fact that I recognize the answer to the problem as right. That. It's not about who has the answer, it's about the fact that the answer is the answer. Where this becomes a bit problematic though is when you, or one of the places where this becomes problematic is when you take this whole discussion and move it into the area of theology. When there are people who insist, I'm only doing this for your only for your own good and what they are doing is religious manipulation or I would say as sister who religious abuse because 
I am very much of the opinion that to impose a belief on someone for whom it may or may not be correct. Obviously, the person imposing it believes this is the one and only right answer. If they're not talking to the person upon whom they are imposing that answer, they have no way of finding out what it is about their answer that doesn't fit this situation. It would be like me going into a shoe store and someone insisting that I am, that my size is, is size 10. And I would have to say, no, you're wrong. My, my shoe size is uh, size 11 and a half to 12. And if the sizes run small, there was one or two times in my life where I even had a size 13. But, but that was because the sizes were manufactured in a way that made them smaller than other thir size 13 shoes. Trying to figure out which shoes fit my feet, only I can try them on and tell the sales clerk how it actually feels. If the sole is too floppy, too soft, too rigid, if the toes are too tiny and, uh, and, my, and my toes inside the shoe are being squished painfully, if the shoe doesn't have the support it needs, uh, the, the support that I would need in order to wear that through my activities each day. Lots of different questions, and, and with my usual fascination for questions, I seem to ramble on asking the same question 15 different ways, hoping to convey my, the concern that's behind it. Have there been times when I myself have said to someone, I'm only doing this for your own good. I don't think so, but I'm sure there are times when I have acted in that way. In some cases, it was because I did understand the situation and having looked and listened, it became very clear to me that the other person didn't understand the situation with which he or she was dealing. That something was about to happen and I could not come up with a way of describing what was about to happen you know, any way of explaining that that would be persuasive and effective. But I knew, for example, that I had to pull the person off the tracks because the train was coming. And maybe for whatever reason, they didn't know anything about trains, they didn't know where they were, they were, I didn't know, any number of possible things. The responsibility I believe I have in that situation is not to just pull them out of danger and abandon them, but to be with them in dialogue, to sit with them through the experience and to explain as well as I can why I did what I did and is there some other concern that you have that I can further address. You know, that the reason I pull them out of the way of the train so they wouldn't get killed, but the reason they wanted to go the other direction was because they dropped something on the other side. Well, let's go look for whatever it is you dropped. Uh, there needs to be an ongoing commitment of support. It's not just about superseding somebody else and putting myself in the way of their choice. It's about engaging with them as a friend, as another member of the human family, That to remember that at the bottom level, Humanity is one big family, and we care about each other because we're family. We care about each other because it's another human life, and we want someone to care, care about our human life also. That ultimately we're all in this together, and it's a closed system. And you can't have the rich and the poor without somebody going without, and somebody simply not having enough. And I'm trying to remember who it was. I believe maybe it was Dwight Eisenhower who said that, that every missile that's manufactured ultimately uh, represents a theft from, from the people who do not have what they need, who are doing without, for the horrendous expense that it costs to go to war and to maintain a war. 
that there are people who are homeless and starving and without their needs met because of the violence that is being supported while the people are not. I was talking with someone the other day about people and programs and policies and trying to resolve problems of homelessness and so forth and they kept mentioning that well there's this program and there's that program and there's this financial concern and and I said I would really like to shift the conversation from free from being about programs and policies to being about people that ultimately it's not about what the loan rate is or what the price is it's about here is a person how do we create a system within which this person this person not all people but this person can legitimately get his or her needs met a very long time ago I had a temp job a temporary assignment uh, doing administrative office work uh, for a social services agency and the thing that was that most impressed me or the thing most impressed upon me during the time I was working there was that it was about programs and a paper chase and that if people came to their offices with the right pieces of paper everything would fall into place and their needs would be met and if they were missing one particular piece of paper everything was deadlocked and they had to go find a way to get that piece of paper or there simply wasn't going to be any help for them and it always bothered me, but I really didn't know what to what to point. That there were people going home with needs unmet that weren't going to be met because the program wasn't set up to meet people's needs. The program was set was set up to implement a particular economic uh, housing related structure. It wasn't about meeting the person's need. It was about managing the material resource. Material resources come and go. They can be manufactured, they can be hauled to the dump. Sometimes they have sentimental value. They have a certain importance, yes. But it still comes back to the people and what is happening to that individual's life and that that individual is not the embodiment of a category and they may be experiencing needs that are totally unique in comparison to everyone else with whom one has met that entire week. If we lose the ability to feel for each other, the best of our humanity and the reason for trying so hard to make human life last on this planet will be lost. I find again and again that when people become oppressive ogres in their jobs is generally at that that point at which they have left their humanity behind. When they are not supposed to know or feel or love but when they are simply supposed to do in a robotic sort of fashion that's when all the worst problems start to literally come out of the woodwork so to speak just problems and problems and more problems when in regaining our humanity in regaining our ability to love one another and be with each other and and mourn with those who mourn and rejoice with those who rejoice and work with those who work and and be with each other even if we are completely different even if we completely disagree we can be with each other, we can observe the same experience, we can observe how the other person responds to it, and we can even look in a mirror and observe how we respond to our experiences as well. And when something really upsets me about another person, I have to remember that it's not always about that other person. Sometimes, I mean, I have to go home and ask myself, why does this upset me so much? Evidently, I care about it much more than I thought I did, and perhaps even more than I thought I should. All that being said, it is what it is, and I don't think we should necessarily resign ourselves to it. It is what it is is not just a statement that says it can't be more than that, because sometimes it can. 
it's an acknowledgement of truth. But the thing to remember about truth is that it's very contextual. You change the context, you change the truth. If you don't want there to be homelessness in your country, then you look for the reasons that homelessness has happened. Not just what are the most common reasons, but to interview individuals and say, what is your reason? And knowing that reason, figuring out where the weak links in the chain are, that, well, if we had managed to cut it off at this point, then that would have stopped all these other things from happening. So maybe we need to develop uh, a, a methodology or a strategy that can do specifically that to prevent anyone else from having your experience. I guess, for better or for worse, one of the main themes in my relationship to humanity is that I continue to see all people as equals. That, well, growing up, people would talk about somebody being really blessed by God and consequently having all this money. Well, that kind of implies that everyone else was not. And, but that didn't go along with what I understood about God from Sunday school and my own reading and so forth. It's not, it's recognizing where the logic doesn't add up. And at that point, finding a way to infuse some love. Because every solution I've, of which I've ever heard always, always involves some infusion of love. And if that is the one and only thing we do, we'll still be better off than we are. I've covered a lot of ground in this episode. I hope I've shared some things that will be helpful to you. And before you ever say, I'm only doing this for your own good, be sure you've listened long enough to know who this person truly is, whom you wish to help. Thank you for watching.